Good morning, everyone. My name is Estrella Martinez. Today is the last day of our symposium. And it's time uh, for our first uh, speaker of Wednesday, Dr. Julio Vera Gonzalez. Dr. Julio Vera Gonzalez is a research leader and professor in dermatology at a University Hospital Erlangen, United States. He received his PhD degree in molecular biology and biochemistry from the University of La Laguna, Spain. Science, his postdoctoral position has studied cancer within the system biology scope. He is focused on explaining the similarities and difference between um, cancer and aging. His research includes developing database mathematical models to investigate the DNA damage response, the role of P53, and some the, of the other proteins whose expression is promoted by P53 after the mesh. Today, we are here to listen to his talk on system and network approaches to optimize cancer immunotherapy in Thanks for your time, Dr. Julio Vera Gonzalez. Many thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Julio Vera Gonzalez. I'm professor of systems tumor in immunology at the University Friedrich Alexander from Erlangen and Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, and today I want to talk about uh, the idea of applying uh, systems biology and network bio uh, biology uh, in the optimization or the improvement of cancer immunotherapy. And I'm going to use melanoma as an example. Just to, to start my talk, uh, I want to say something about our laboratory. So we have a, a laboratory of medical bioinformatics, but the interesting question of our laboratory is that we are uh, embedded. We are uh, in a clinical department in the, in the University Hospital here in Erlangen. And our focus, our, our laboratory is a laboratory on systems tumor immunology. So we are interested in the interplay between the immune system and cancer. And our main focus is uh, melanoma. And uh, to this end, we are using next generation sequencing. We are using network biology, but we are also using mechanistic computational modeling and machine learning. And our team is a multidisciplinary team. So we have people like me, I'm a physicist by background. But we also have uh, bioinformaticians, computer scientists, and different types of molecular uh, biology and molecular uh, medicine uh, researchers. So the idea of my talk today is I want to make a brief introduction and I want to show some results we have generated when using uh, data-driven computational modeling uh, to understand uh, uh, the therapy uh, apply and the diagnostics in the case of uh, metastatic uh, melanoma. So I want to start giving a very brief introduction about what is melanoma. So melanoma is a, a type of skin cancer that is originated by the abnormal growth of some types of special co uh, cells called melanocytes. So the melanocytes are cells that are located at the bottom layer of, of the epidermis in the skin. And they are actually special because they produce the pigment called melanin. And the important thing about uh, melanin is that this is the dark pigment we have in our skin that protects us against the ultraviolet uh, radiation. So it's very important for protecting us against cancer. But what happened in melanoma is that we have a number of mutations affecting uh, these uh, melanocytes and then they have an abnormal growth. And uh, malignant melanoma that comes uh, uh, here is uh, the most aggressive type of skin cancer in many regions in the world. The, the very interesting question here is that the, the, the percentage of uh, people diagnosed with this uh, cancer when we talk about skin cancer is very small, like only 4% of the, of the patients uh, that have skin cancer are diagnosed with malignant melanoma. But when we talk about the number of people who die uh, with uh, skin cancer, malignant melanoma accounts for 70% of the patients. 
Also very interesting is that uh, a large fraction of the patients, they can be totally cured when the disease is diagnosed on, on due time. And for example, you have that 98% of the patients survive more than five years after the diagnosis, if, as I say, diagnosis and surgery is done in proper time. However, so for those people who develop the metastatic version of, of the melanoma, uh, this is very good, bad news because uh, this type of tumor is very aggressive and is resistant to uh, conventional therapy and also to targeted uh, molecular therapies. And that's why uh, until very recent, uh, the survival uh, and the percentage of people who survive more than 10 years after the diagnosis was just uh, around 10%. Everything changed for melanoma in 2010 when this, publish was, uh, with this paper was published. This was a, a large multicenter, multinational clinical study in which a new type of therapy was used to treat metastatic melanoma patients. I, uh, and that was the first time that we, uh, we have got in a consistent manner on, over a large population of, of patients uh, improvement in the prognosis and the survival of metastatic melanoma patients. So the, the therapy we, that was used here was a, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So this is a type of uh, cancer immunotherapy. It's a drug that is able to abolish the ab ability of uh, tumor cells to block the activation of uh, T cells. And uh, what uh, we have found after more than 10 years uh, of approval and use of this therapy is that uh, checkpoint inhibitor-based uh, therapy, uh, it's a benefit for a large fraction of metastatic uh, melanoma patients, but also we have found out that this therapy is also effective in other types of uh, solid uh, tumors, no? metastatic solid tumors. However, there's a dark side uh, in uh, checkpoint inhibitor-based uh, immunotherapy in cancer. And, it, and that is that still like 40% of the patients in melanoma are not responding to the therapy. So we have still many patients that are not benefiting from this, but also even when they benefit, a large fraction of the patients suffer from some types of uh, side effects. In most of the cases, we are talking about immune related adverse effects. So we have uh, autoimmune like reactions to the therapy that happen in the bowel, in the lungs, in the heart, in some, uh, in some muscles. And uh, very often these, these uh, side effects are severe or can even be fatal. That's why, I mean, th this is uh, a very interesting case because for, for melanoma, we have a clear need for improving the therapy. We have to do improve the therapy because still a large fraction of the patients uh, do not benefit. They are not responding to the, to the, to the therapy. Also, because we have uh, to try to avoid or to reduce these immune-related side effects we find in a large fraction of the patients. And that's uh, why I and many th people think that uh, immunotherapy in the case of metastatic melanoma is the perfect uh, case study for applying what people now call the precision medicine. So for many people, we are now in what is what we, we, one could call the age of the precision medicine. And this is because over the last decade for many diseases, especially for many types of aggressive cancers, we have accumulated large cohorts of patients with a lot of samples. Also, we have now a large array of different uh, technologies that can be used to profile uh, solid tumor samples or liquid biopsies. So we are talking about, for example, omics technologies, but also very advanced microscopic technologies and other types of imaging technologies. Also, we have now power enough computers that are able to store these large amounts of data and are able to analyze the data. And in the last decade, we also have developed a lot of uh, types of computational models and computational algorithms that are able to mine this data and extract uh, important information. And uh, I and many th people think that melanoma is a parad that paradigmatic case, a very good case state for study for precision medicine, because 
as we see, we have still an urgent medical necessity to treat uh, and to make uh, better diagnostics for uh, melanoma patients, especially for those that are resistant to the checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Also because uh, melanoma is the perfect case study for developing new generations of immunotherapy. And this is because uh, of the molecular uh, features of, of melanoma. And also because skin and melanoma are a perfect ideal case for a number of new technologies for uh, profiling of, of, of tumor samples. And this is due especially because skin is very accessible. It's very easy to analyze skin with uh, different types of technology, especially imaging-based uh, technologies. So today in my talk, I want to distinguish and to talk about two different types of computational models that can be used in, in precision uh, medicine. On the one hand, we have what we call machine learning uh, and deep learning uh, based computational models. And these type of models are used uh, nowadays for uh, the classification of patients based on, on, on patient data. Here, the idea essentially is that with this type of algorithms, we can build computational algorithms that can be trained with large amounts of so-called label data from patients. And this computational algorithm you can uh, generate can uh, be very good uh, to uh, improve uh, the diagnostics of, uh, of different types of cancer. So here, the idea essentially is represented in this figure here. So we, we collect samples from the patient, from a large cohort of patients. We profile uh, the samples. We generate a database with this uh, data, and then this data is used to train computational models. And then the model is trained, it's validated with additional data. And once validated, it could be used to make, for example, diagnostics of patients. And the data we use here is represented by this uh, array here. So we have for a number of patients, we have the molecular profiling or the imaging profiling of the tumor together with uh, the clinical annotation. And this type of models actually have been very successfully employed in, in melanoma in recent years, especially we are talking here about, about what people call their dermoscopic image-based uh, deep learning uh, models. And uh, there have been in recent years very, very good papers published in this topic. For example, uh, some years ago, there was a, a, a nature paper published in which this type of deep learning, deep learning models were used to classify skin, skin lesions. No? So the idea in, in, in this paper uh, was to build using a large amount of dermoscopic images, so photos of uh, skin lesions. This information was used to train a, a complex type of neural network. And the idea was that this neural network would be able to suppose you have a photo of, of a lesion from a new patient you feed it into the algorithm and it will classify this lesion into a number of different types of, of skin lesions. This is what is essentially represented here. So you could essentially using this algorithm, uh, classify uh, different photos of lesions into many different types of, uh, of skin lesions. Some of them are mal malignant cancer, others not. What these people found, and it's, this is very interesting, when they compare the performance of their algorithm with the uh, performance uh, they, uh, they get when with the same images for, uh, from a trained dermatologist, they found out what this figure here indicates, that this algorithm on average performs better than the, the dermatologists that were essentially classifying the same images. So, I mean, you could think that this type of uh, deep learning uh, models, when they are used for imaging data, they can perform very well and they can be used in diagnostics. But this type of algorithms can also be used with a different type of data. So one can build uh, machine learning models and deep learning uh, uh, models using the molecular profiling of patient samples and of uh, tumor samples. And this is something we are in our group have been working for a long time. Uh, and uh, recently, last year, we published a paper together with some collaborators in China in which we develop this type of deep learning algorithms 
uh, to characterize uh, melanoma. So our approach essentially was to combine uh, omics data taken from uh, tumor samples from melanoma patients together with uh, deep learning algorithms and network biology analysis. And we combine all these methods to stratify patients and to try to understand the molecular signatures behind uh, these patients. So how did this works essentially? So we collect from a number of patients genomics data. We integrate this data into a very detailed elaborated network uh, for melanoma, and in this way, we can somehow make connections between the different genes. Then this information from the network and from genomics data is analyzed, uh, or is used to train a uh, neural network, so a type of deep learning uh, algorithm. And the idea of this algorithm is essentially to help us stratify in patients or to find molecular differences between uh, groups of, of patients. So this, the, the key point or the starting point of our uh, analysis was the construction of a, a large detailed network for melanoma. And what, what, we, what we actually did is uh, later on, we modularized this network. So we divided in sub networks of genes that are highly connected. And this was for us the key point to later on take different levels of molecular data, project it into the network and use this information to build our uh, deep learning algorithm. And this is what is represented here. Essentially, the data we, the molecular data we were considering was expression data, so RNA-seq data, uh, methylation data, uh, mutations in the genes, and also uh, changes in the copy number for the genes. No? So all these are different types of molecular data that we can essentially project into our networks. So then the idea was we wanted to use a special type of deep learning model called, uh, called autoencoder to make a reduction and aggregation and dimensionality reduction of the data. So here, the idea essentially is, this is more or less the structure of, of, the, of this algorithm. We have a first part of the algorithm that is uh, of the structure of the network that is called encoder, a final part that is called decoder. And in between, we have another part of the network. It's a hidden layer that is called latent feature layer. And the idea here, what this algorithm makes is we try to train an algorithm that will use all our data as an input set and will re-aggregate the information, uh, make a strong the reduction in the dimensionality of the data. But the idea is that when we try to decode later on the information, we are able to get as an output uh, a representation of the data that contains uh, as much of the initial information as uh, possible. No? So we aggregate, but we try to keep as much of the data features as possible. This is the, the key idea of this methodology. So, and then for example, what we did here essentially is we try to reduce, we go, we went from a um, data structure that contained 5,000 features for uh, transcriptomic data, um, another 5,000 features for methylation data over our roughly 500 patients. And we make a dimensionality reduction and we ended up in a data structure that contained 21, only 21 features for uh, the patients we were considering. So this is the idea. We could aggregate uh, heavily the, the data we have. So once we have made this aggregation, we use this aggregation scores to make a stratification of the patients. And this is what is represented in this figure here, in this heat map, as you could see here, with this aggregation scores we obtained with our deep learning algorithm, we were able to stratify, to classify the patients into three different clusters. And as you see, the, the, there is clear cut differences in the values of these uh, aggregation scores between the, the, the three different clusters we found here. And when an, an interesting feature we found here is that these three clusters we could create, they show a clear cut different in the survival of the patient. So when we took the, the patients behind this cluster and we make a Kaplan-Meier analysis to look for the, the differences in the survival time for, uh, for these patients, we could find that there was one cluster, the cluster number three, 
that had a, a statistically significant survival differences when compared to the other clusters. So taking together, so it's not only that we can aggregate the information, but we can also find uh, clear cut differences between the, the patients. So once uh, we have done this aggregation, the, we can use the uh, information generated and open it, uh, making use of network biology and interpretable uh, machine learning algorithm to try to understand uh, why, uh, which features are a part of this aggregation and why they are important. And this is, for example, something we did using the so-called shapely additive uh, explanations, which are able, for example, for one of the sub-networks we constructed, are able to tell us which molecular features are behind this uh, community, this sub-network, and also how important each one of these features were in terms of the ability to aggregate uh, and to classify uh, the data. An additional thing we can still do by combining this deep learning algorithm with uh, network analysis uh, tools is we can try to uh, now link each one of those uh, two networks we found important to stratify the patients. We can link them with different uh, functions, cell functions and pathways. And this is what we can see here in this figure. So here we have the different class, the, the different sub networks we constructed. And then we see how we can associate each one of them individually to a number of key cell functions. And we can uh, uh, somehow here put hits uh, of how the genes integrated in these communities are linked to the different cell functions uh, we have there. So taking together, this information can, uh, genetic information can be analyzed by combining network analysis and deep learning algorithms. And this can help us making a stratification of the patients. But there's something very important we have to understand about machine learning and deep learning algorithms. These algorithms are very good classifiers. They can be used and they work to classify uh, patients based on molecular data but they are what we call black box algorithms. So this means they are very good for making predictions and for classifying patients, but later on, it's very difficult to open the model and try to understand in a mechanistic manner why the classification worked so well. For making or for having a mechanistic understanding of what's happening, we have to use systems medicine and we have to use systems medicine based computational models. Here, the approach is totally different. Here, what we have is we make a multidisciplinary approach to try to integrate, to try to analyze quantitative data, making use of uh, mechanistic mathematical uh, models. So how does this work? This is represented in this workflow. The first thing we do is we take the biological knowledge we have about the system which molecules are important, how they interact with each other, and use it to build a mathematical model. But this mathematical model we construct, this computational model is different to those we have in machine learning. Because remember, machine learning models are black box model, but in systems biology, we build mechanistic models. This means the, com the computational equations we are building are encoding the mechanistic understanding of the system. So we can attribute mechanisms to the different equations we are building in our, uh, in our model. So once we have the equations, what we do is we attribute, we give values to the parameters in these equations by integrating the mathematical model with experimental data into the so-called model calibration. So um, a calibrated model is validated by checking that the predictions of the model match with new data that was not used for the calibration. If this does not work, one can refine the model, but if this works, then we have a validating model that can be used to make predictive simulations to help us having a mechanistic understanding on uh, how, for example, the resistance to a given therapy happens. So if you take everything together, so these systems medicine-based models are good because we can integrate in a mechanistic manner knowledge 
quantitative data and hypotheses. These models are very good to characterize the dynamics and the regulation at the molecular level of, of the processes. And one can use uh, computational algorithms and model simulations, for example, based on, on this type of systems medicine models to check the consistencies of, of the quantitative data we have produced to help us formulating hypotheses or designing experiments. And finally, and this is, I think, the key point for us here today to help us understanding and quantifying the effect of, of drugs and the effect, for example, of immunotherapies. And this is actually what we have been working on for a number of years in our group. And I want to show you now two additional examples in which we have used these systems medicine-based uh, algorithms. In one of them, we may use of uh, ordinary differential equation-based uh, models to try to help us understanding why melanoma is resistant to chemotherapy. That was uh, some results we published a few years ago together with some experimental collaborators in uh, the University of Rostock. So here the idea is we want to, to understand the role of a given molecule, the E2F transcription factor in uh, therapy resistant. So this, this transcription factor is a, a very important molecule that controls uh, cell cycle in cells, but it's also a very important molecule for cancer because it's a tumor suppressor and it's able to promote DNA repair and cell apoptosis upon uh, DNA uh, damage in normal cells, but in cancer cells, it can also act as an oncogene because when it's deregulated, it can promote uh, invasiveness of the tumor and it can promote uh, the ability of the tumor to grow vessels or to get uh, angiogenesis. And also people have found that this, this gene actually is able to promote the resistant to chemotherapy. And that's the reason why we were interested on this, on this gene. So actually what we wanted to do was we wanted to build a computational model, an ODE systems medicine computational model, and, we, and use this model to try to derive predictive gene signatures explaining why therapy resistance happens. How did we do this? So essentially what we did is we collected uh, data and information from the literature and from databases to help us constructing the network, explaining how E2F plays a role in the response of melanoma cells to chemotherapy. And this is what this figure here is represented. So this is the information we collected in a schematic figure. So we have E2F here. We have some other molecules that, inter that have a, a very uh, tight interplay with E2F. We have uh, how different types of uh, chemotherapy can interact with E2F here. And then we also have uh, how E2F and the other partners can regulate a number of molecules, transcriptional targets that regulate the ability of the cells to die, so to go for apoptosis after getting uh, the chemotherapy. So then this is our schematic. This is the mechanism we want to represent. And what we did is we translate this mechanism into a computational model in ordinary differential equations. And our model was composed by different modules. So we have a module that was representing the tight regulation interplay between E2F, another molecule that is called P73 and the micron 205 We have a second module in which this core model essentially is regulating a number of targets, transcriptional targets that get expressed. The, regulation, the expression gets regulated by E2F1. And finally, what we did is we, these targets are connected to an additional ordinary differential equation that describes the dynamics of the tumor cell population. So here, the decision whether the, the cell dies in apo through apoptosis or proliferates is somehow controlled by the expression levels of the transcriptional targets we have in our model. So if you take everything together, what you have is a complex all the ordinary differential equation model that integrates different levels of, of information and that integrates molecular events together with uh, cell population uh, dynamics. 
And what you can do very nicely with this model is what I represent here. Uh, okay, here. So you see, just to show you how the model looks like, this is one of the of our ordinary differential equations. So this is representing the variation over the time in the uh, concentration of the inactive fraction of this receptor here. And as you see, we have different rate equations accounting for the different processes that influence uh, the, uh, the dynamics of this uh, receptor. And we have parameters here that are the Ks, so K30, K36, for example. And we have, for example, this, in, uh, this input uh, uh, parameter here in our model, which is actually accounting for the effect of a cytostatic drug in the activation of this uh, receptor. So what this model can do, actually, we can model the administration of our drug. Then we can see how the administration of this drug will somehow modify the regulation of the core regulatory network. Then this is going to propagate and provoke changes in the expression of the transcriptional targets. And ultimately, changes in this transcriptional target expression will affect the cell population dynamics and will make the decision whether the cell will die because of the drug or whether the cell will proliferate or survive uh, resist to the therapy. That's the idea. So you can uh, simulate everything from, uh, from there. No? So and then our idea was to use this, this model to simulate or to generate in silico signatures explaining how EQF can induce uh, chemotherapy resistance. No? So how did we do this? So essentially well, we have our computational model. We systematically perturb the values of the model parameters so as you see, we make a large amount of simulations here. So for each one of these perturbation in the values of the model parameters, we perform a number of simulations. And these simulations, what they do essentially is they look at what happened, whether what happened with the population of the tumor cells after applying genotoxic chemotherapy or cytostatic chemotherapy. So we perform simulations, we store the values and then we classify the simulations into groups, depending whether, for example, at the end of the simulation, uh, the population of the, of the cells disappear, which means the cells were sensitive to the chemotherapy, or the population of the tumor cells uh, survive, means they were resistant to the chemotherapy. So then with this, we group uh, the solutions, and then we make some statistical analysis and this is what is represented in this figure here. So you see for the different molecular uh, markers we have in our computational model, we have here the, uh, the statistics for the expression level in non-stress conditions for each one of them in different groups of simulations we found. And as you see here, we have a, a color code to discriminate the different uh, groups of, of simulations we found. We have in blue, for example, simulations, uh, the group of simulations in which the tumor cells were able to resist to the genotoxic drug. We have in green, the solutions in which the cells resist, survive to the cytost uh, cytostatic drug. And then we have in red solutions in which uh, cells survive to both uh, therapies. And you, what you can see here is that for some of our molecular markers, there is clear cut differences in the expression levels for the markers for the different types of uh, uh, simulations we did, no? and the different populations of simulations. And something very interesting here we found is an interplay between E2F1 and Micron 205 As you see, they are somehow anti-correlated when the expression of E2F1 uh, increases, the expression of micron 205 decrease. So then what we did is we went back to the, to the model and make very detailed simulations in which we systematically change the expression levels for E2F1 and for the micron and we compute after applying the genotoxic drug, how many cells survive to the therapy. And this is what is represented in this figure here. And with this information in hand, we went talk with our experimental collaborators, and then they decide an in vitro experiment with this represented in with this bar plot figure here, in which they try to mimic essentially what we did in our simulations. 
they play around with the repression of uh, E2F on, on the microRNA, and then they check when they in this uh, when they repress these molecular markers and apply the genotoxic drug. They check how many of the cells survive uh, to the therapy. And we actually found a very good agreement between our model simulations, here represented by the numbers, and the experimental data produced by the collaborators. So you take everything together. What we did actually is we built a systems medicine-based ordinary differential equation model, accounting for how the regulation of E2F1 affects the ability of melanoma cells to resist to, to chemotherapy. We use systematic model simulations to generate in silico signatures accounting for how, how these cells are able to resist to the therapy. And then we use this information to design experiments uh, that uh, somehow validate the model predictions. So then I want to uh, mention some things about all ordinary differential equation models. So these models are very popular in systems medicine, and this is because they have a number of advantages. So one of them is that they are very well established. There's many people who have a lot of knowledge on how to use ordinary differential equation models. It's relatively easy to, to set up rules to derive these type of models. And we, with these models, you can make very uh, sophisticated simulations, but we also have a, a lot, a large amount of algorithms and analytical methods to investigate the model and to understand mechanistically what's happening with the model. And these models also are very good to represent non-linearity behavior you find in this type of molecular circuits. For example, when you have feedback loops, positive and negative feedback loops, and they are also very good representing the time and evolution of the system, what I call here dynamics. But they also have some disadvantages. One of them, for example, is that to characterize, to calibrate these models, you need a large amount of quantitative data. And another important issue here is that they are not good for representing spatial information and spatial processes, okay? So if a special information on how molecules diffuse or how cells interact with each other are important for you, all the models are not good. And this is something very important, especially when you are talking about cancer immunotherapy. Why? And this is the reason why actually in my, the last part of my talk, I want to talk about how to build systems medicine computational models that can account for these special features in the context of cancer immunotherapy. So when we are talking about uh, immuno cancer immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor uh, immunotherapy, these special features are very important because the, the, the way how different types of immune cells interact with the cancer cells in a spatial manner is very important to represent the mechanism by which the immunotherapy works or by which the tumor is able to avoid the immunotherapy. What, uh, the reason why this is happening is because, for example, it is known that uh, the, um, the, the amount of uh, cytotoxic T cells that infiltrate the tumor and how efficient this infiltration happened is very important to this, decide whether the tumor will be resistant to the immunotherapy or not. But also, for example, it's also very important to know how other immune cells, like for example, tumor-associated macrophages, how they are uh, distributed in the tumor. It's very important to, to know whether this tumor will be uh, sensitive to the immunotherapy. And that's why for understanding this, or for understanding how immunotherapy works in melanoma, we have to build spatial models. No? And this was actually what we wanted to do. We wanted to derive, to build, and to calibrate a spatial model accounting for melanoma micrometastasis. And we wanted to include in this model the interplay of the micrometastasis with the immune system. And we wanted also to include spatial features that could explain, could predict whether the tumor would be resistant or not to checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. 
And finally, something that, that that's something we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to integrate omics patient data into the model analysis and the model simulations. Why? Why this is important? This is uh, this last part is very important because at this moment we have uh, protocols and we have technologies to produce uh, in a systematic manner omics data characterizing the tumor. And if we find a way of integrating this omics data into our spatial systems medicine simulations, we can have a, uh, a large benefit on our ability to understand how immunotherapy works. No? That's the key idea, and that's why we were very interested on that. So now I want to give you a workflow on how we work to, to produce this model. So we first generated a draft of our model using knowledge available. Then we calibrated our computational model. Then we try to integrate, as we said, omics data into the model analysis. And to do this, actually, we make differential expression analysis from uh, uh, transcriptomics data of patients that uh, were uh, go undergoing checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and they were resistant or sensitive to the therapy. And then at the end, we come up with a computational uh, method uh, to try to generate also here signatures explaining how the therapy resistance happens. No? This was essentially what we did. So just to give you an idea how uh, uh, works our spatial model, this figure here representing the three levels of spatial features we were considering in our model. So we wanted, we are considering here how the cell to cell interactions happen. So how one cell detects and interact with other cells in the tumor. And for this, uh, we use or we set, up, we set up a model that is based in rules. We also wanted to consider spatial features in the, in the tumor metastasis. Uh, so on the structure and the compos composition on the metastasis. And finally, we also wanted to link this with the systemic immune response. So how, for example, immune cells are recruited to the uh, metastasis. And then the model approach we use here was a hybrid multi-level model. So for example, to represent the interactions between the cells, we built an agent-based model. So here, the idea is that the behavior of the cells, the migration and movement of the cells, how one cell interacts with another cell, how one tumor cell interacts with an immune cell was described in, a, in our model using computer coded rules. And then we have to set up a number of rules to account for how the adaptive immune cell works in the tumor and also how the immune, innate immunity uh, works in the tumor. And just to show you, uh, to illustrate you how this uh, uh, computer coded rule models works, this is, for example, the probabilistic rule we built to represent, to try to simulate what happens when one cytotoxic T cell detects, finds, and detects a tumor cell and have to make the decision whether it uh, target these cells for uh, killing, okay? For example, as you see, we attributed this process is uh, based on probability, and this is the probability equation we developed to try to account for uh, how, when and how this uh, T cell mediated killing of the tumor cell happens. We also, it's very important in our model to account for the diffusion of uh, cytokines and other types of ligands. And this was representing using partial differential equations. And finally, for accounting for the recruitment of the immune cells to the micrometastasis, we may use also of ordinary differential equations and delay differential equations, okay? And for example, here for this case, you could see uh, this is the equation we use to represent the recruitment rate uh, for T cells. So how uh, quick, uh, how efficient is the recruitment of T cells to the tumor? So this is when we you take all together, this is an schematic representation of our model. And here you see how we represented the effect of the checkpoint inhibitor therapy able to somehow promote the activation and the detection of the cancer cells. And this is a prototype simulation we can do with our model. 
As you see, this is some spatial models. We have a 3D projection, projection on how the model evolves over time. And this is what you can see here. So we have here four time uh, points in over a, a, a simulation of our model. And you see here in blue, you have the tumor cells. In orange, you have the cytotoxic T cells. And in other colors that are less visible, you have other types of immune cells. And as you see here, we can uh, simulate over the time how the interplay between the simulations happens. And for example, here you have another prototypical uh, simulation in which we have included, uh, we have administered, we have simulated the chemo, the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and we see what is the effect as you see in the simulation. So to validate uh, our model, we compare the behavior of um, our model with well-known uh, behavior of, of tumors when you apply uh, checkpoint inhibitor uh, immunotherapy. And you consider some very important uh, molecular feature here, which is the level of infiltration of T cells into the tumor. And you see, for example, here in, the, in this panel here, you have for two different levels of infiltration of, T cell, of cytotoxic T cells, 10 different uh, simulations when we have low level of infiltration and when we have high level of infiltration. As you could see here, if you don't apply the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, doesn't matter if you have low or high level of T cell infiltration, the, sum, the tumor will proliferate, will continue growing. In this other panel, we have what happens when you ap apply uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and at the same time, you are considering the level of uh, uh, cytotoxic T cell infiltration. As you see here, if you have a low level of cytotoxic T cell infiltration, our model simulations indicate that the tumor will be resistant to the therapy and most, in most of the simulations, the tumor continue growing. However, if you have a high level of cytotoxic T cell infiltration, most of the, in most of the simulation, the tumor gets abolished. So you get a depletion of the tumor cells and then you can consider that these are the conditions in which uh, the therapy actually works. And because our model is stochastic, so then there are some stochastic effects here and not all the, simul the simulations will behave in the same manner. So now, how do we integrate the omics data into the simulations? So what we did essentially is we took data from a cohort of patients in which some patients were uh, resistant to the therapy and others were sensitive to the therapy. We make differential expression analysis to find the genes that somehow discriminate between the two groups. Then we apply gene set uh, enrichment and network uh, pathway enrichment analysis to find which pathways, which molecular pathways are behind these differential expressed genes. And this is what this table represents here. We have a ranking of pathways that are differentially expressed in patients that are sensitive to the therapy compared to patients that are resistant to the, to the therapy. Uh, so we have now a connection between the genes and the functions. And then in the next step, what we do is we connect these cellular functions with some parameters in our uh, spatial model. And how do we do this essentially? So what we do essentially is we make a, a manual connection of the parameters with the uh, gene set uh, enrichment terms we found uh, there. And this is what this actually this table shows here. So this is the, ta the table with our enriched pathways. And then we actually link these pathways with a number of parameters and processes we are modeling in our spatial model. This way, the enrichment analysis help us deciding which are the important parameters that we have to perturb in our model to make simulations and understand how the uh, resistance to the therapy is happening. This is essentially here, the key point is, this way we select the parameters that we are going to perturb later on. So once we have done this, what we do essentially is something similar to what we did with the OD model. Now we systematically perturb these parameters we have selected 
we make simulations with our model uh, in which we simulate checkpoint inhibitor therapy in our melanoma micrometastasis and we see whether uh, over the, the, the time of the simulation, the tumor disappears or the tumor continue growing. And then what we do is we again group these simulations into groups. So a group of simulations in which uh, the tumor is sensitive to the therapy and another group in which is not sensitive is resistant to the therapy. And then what we do later on is essentially we apply some algorithms for data analysis to try to group uh, these solutions and try to somehow find uh, signatures in the in the model that are accounting for these uh, different types of uh, resistant or not resistant groups. And to this end, we actually use a decision tree, which is represented here, in which, I mean, the label to discriminate is based on whether we have uh, at the end of the simulation, uh, resistant uh, a population of cancer cells that are resistant to the therapy or not. No? And this is what essentially our decision tree is representing. You see with the color code, we have uh, nodes in the decision tree that accounts for groups of uh, solutions in which the tumor is clear. So all the tumor cells are killed by the immunotherapy. These are the blue. And then we have other nodes in our decision tree that accounts for the groups of uh, uh, simulations in which actually the metastasis is resistant to the therapy and continue growing. And then once you have done this, actually you can somehow open up your decision tree. You can go to this, the different nodes and see which are the, the signatures that are representing the different groups. So what are the whether a given process in your, in your model is uh, positively or negatively regulated to, for example, account for the uh, sensitivity to the immunotherapy. Okay, so if we take everything together, as I said, the spatial models are important for cancer immunotherapy because some molecular features that are in, very important to understand whether the therapy works or not, can only be represented if you uh, uh, account for the spatial interactions between the cancer cells and the immune cells. So then you can use your model to generate, uh, essentially to represent and to simulate distinctive scenarios in which the checkpoint inhibitor therapy uh, works or not. As I said, here we can make profits of, of omics data to help, uh, to help us in the design of the computational analysis here to dis decide which processes in our model we want to perturb and we want to simulate to see what is the effect on the effect uh, of the checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. And then the idea is that when we apply this algorithm, we will find in silico generated uh, signatures that account for different mechanisms in which the resistance to the checkpoint inhibitor uh, immunotherapy happens. Mm -hmm. And finally, something that we are working on, we have not, I'm not showing here, but we are working on is we want to uh, make use of patients' omics data to personalize simulations. So the idea here would be that suppose you have a new patient so you take a sample from the tumor of the patient, you get RNA-seq data from this uh, sample. We uh, process the data and then feed it into our computational model and use the model that is somehow characterized with this transcriptomics data to make a personalized simulation that will tell you whether a given uh, patient with this omics data characterizing its tumor will uh, respond or not to the immunotherapy. So this is, as I said, outlook, work in, pro in progress, but I think will be very useful to somehow make a use of, of spatial models in a personalized uh, setup. And with this, I, I want to finish my, my talk. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, our work and the work in our group on 
The cancer immunotherapy is funded by the German federal government through a number of projects on systems medicine. So the so-called IMEBIOMED Melevir project, but also the IMED Melody Model project and the key best projects. Many thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I'm, I'm here to, to reply to, to the questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vera, for the very interesting talk. Now we have some time for questions.
Hi everyone, I'm Brenda Loaiza. Now it's time for our next speaker of this afternoon. This conference is in charge of Dr. Ana Leonor Rivera. Ana Leonor Rivera was born in Mexico City. She is a full-time researcher at the Institute of Nuclear Science, UNAM. As a graduated student, she received the Gavino Barreda Medal Award by the UNAM. She obtained a PhD in science physics from UNAM in 1996. In 2018, she obtained the recognition of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz by the UNAM. She's member of the Mexican National Researcher Systems Level 2. Since February 2020, she is the academic coordinator of the Center of Complexity Science of the UNAM. Her working lines are complex system, time, series analysis, and physiological networks. She has more than 100 publications, of which 65 are research articles published on, on indexed journals and 12 chapters in research books. She has written two special computer programs and has 11 copyrights re registered with in the author Mexico. Her publications have received more than 1,000 citations. Also, she was responsible for the development of the curriculum of the Bachelor of Technology of the UNAM and served at, as its first academic coordinator of Juriquilla campus. Today, we are here to listen to her talk on physiological networks of humans from punctual data. Welcome, Dr. Ana. Hello, I would like to thank the organizers, especially as well as the residents, to invite me to present the results of our group on physiological networks. We will start with our goal, that is to find biomarkers of physiological health, considering humans as complex systems. Our working hypothesis is that human beings are on a static balance, and our methodology is based on that. We will present some results on physiological networks of men, women, young and old physiological healthy subjects, and some patients with metabolic disorders, COVID-19, and akalasi. We will end with some concluded remarks. Let's start with our goal, that is to find healthy markers based on physiological parameters that can be auxiliary in clinical diagnosis or evaluation of treatments. For example, if we want to establish heart rate variability, we can use a time series obtained from a smartwatch, or we can use the retin rate variability to establish diseases that have to be with the cardiorespiratory system. Also, we can find biomarkers based on punctual measurements as a chemical test or tomographies taken from a patient. These biomarkers can may be altered before the symptoms of a disease appear, such that can be auxiliaries in the evaluation of a disease or in the treatment that we are applying to our patients. This will allow us to make a personalized medicine taking in account that these biomarkers will depend on age and sex of the Nature can be explained with two different points of view, reductionist and complexity. Reductionist view split the problem in all the parts that integrate the system and study each of them isolated from the rest. So it provides a very successful approach that it has been used for many years on medicine to attend the patients by all the specialties and that understands completely how it functions a particular part of the organism. Another point of view is integrative, considers not only each system as individual part, but also the interactions between all the systems. These interactions are fundamental to explain this complex system. To understand this complex point of view, let us try to answer what is a complex system using its properties to define it. A complex system consists of many components that are interconnected, that exhibit collective behavior, 
self-organization that produce emergence properties that cannot be understood if we consider only the part that integrate the system. The system properties and these emergencies are due to the interaction between all the parts that consist of a system. They exhibit the scale invariance in space, but also on time. So we can see this fractal structure in the time series at all scales. The principal characteristic is that complex systems adapt to the environment, like the pupil that adapts to the light that is illuminating the system, or our blood pressure that adapts to the changes when we stand up. This is done to process information. For example, if we put our hand on an oven, our brain gives us the signal to take out our hand, to retract the muscles. So this processing of information is vital to survive. So human being is a complex system with hierarchical structures and emergent properties at all the levels. Levels that go from cytosine, part of the DNA that keep individual genetic memory, conforming cardiomyces, muscular cells that produce the cardiac contraction at a cellular level, but also they uh, are parts of the muscular cardiac tissue responsible of the synchronized contractions that allow the pumping of blood in the organism. That is part of this cardiovascular system in charge of supply of oxygen, nutrients, and remove the waste of the organism. One of the many systems that made a human being, human beings organize into families, a group on, in the societies, uh, this led us to produce artistic creation and science. Science that was capable to take us to Mars, to the moon, or to the sun, and to let us to understand how the human body works by itself. It is important to notice that physiological signals depend on the Asian cells of the subjects. For example, here we will analyze the hair ray variability of soldiers that are watching fantasia movie from Walt Disney that is available on the Fisionet database. Each yellow dot corresponds to data from a, the hair ray of a man, while each green dot corresponds to data from a woman. As we see, the standard deviation of the hair ray is larger for young men compared with women. So the woman heart rate is more rigid than the one of men when they are young. But when we are become old, there is no difference between women and men. If we consider not the variability of the signal, but the capability to transmit information measured by the entropy of the signal, that is also a measure of the complexity of the system. We see that there is no statistical difference between women and men when they are young, but there is a big difference when we become old. Men lose this entropy, lose this capability to transmit information in comparison with women. Let's now discuss about our working hypothesis. Physiological signals are robust. We want that our hair is beating each second or that our body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius. But also, we need to adapt to environmental changes. If there is a lion trying to eat us, we need to run. So our hair has to adapt to these changes 
uh, by variations on is her, is her rate limit. Our hypothesis is that physiological health lies between a deterministic dynamics with high correlations, robust parameters, very established values of uh, the physiological biomarkers, and random, a random dynamics with low correlations with the stochasticity on the parameters that can allow them to adapt to changes on the environment. Health is in this homeostatic balance, in this control, between being robust or being random. We can adapt, but we also need to be with fixed values. This balance is destroyed when we become ill or when we become old, that we are very robust, very resilient, or when we become sick because we are living in under extreme conditions where the where we go to the other side of randomness of low correlations. This is very well illustrated on this cartoon of Kino that shows that this doctor verifies on a patient how he has his hair rate and see that is beating each second. So he told to the uh, Senor Perez that he's very healthy, making a clam on his back, but due to the, that he's so robust, he cannot react to this change of the environment and because of the lack of adaptation, he died. So physiological health is exactly in this balance between these two dynamics. Our hypothesis that health is in a myostatic balance between robustness and adaptability can be confirmed by measurements of time series that represents, for example, a variable like temperature. And when we submitted to external perturbations like changes of the weather, the, the controller of the maze effector variables to add, for example, contraction of the vessels or uh, sudoration, etc. There is a physiological response to make a corrected actions that makes that variable regulated. And the regulated variable is measured by a sensor that establishes that our set point is 37 degrees Celsius and make a error signal measuring with this age point and depending on if we are on that balance that we need to establish or not, this is this mechanism go and go on until we reach this established value. But also we cannot only use time series analysis to understand this homeostatic balance. We can also construct a physiological network and analyze the topological characteristics of this network to understand this homeostatic balance between all the systems that integrate the world. Our methodology is based on networks. Networks are easily understood via human relations. We consider each node as a human being and we draw a line connecting two humans that are friends or that work together or that they are family, the stronger the line is the stronger the relation between them. As you see from this plot, there are humans that are hubs, that are central nodes with many connections, with many friends around them, but there are also few people that has almost no connections, that has almost no contact, that are isolated on the network, but they are part of the network. So networks can be seen by uh, human relations or also by transportation on Mexico City, for example. Here we see all the connections that are on the steers on the Mexico map. But also you can make a salt graph from this. You can consider not all the network of the on the Mexico City that would be very complex, 
but you can consider only the transportation network. Or more specific, the subway or metro stations that met this network that connects one point of the city with another point of the city by a direct way or by transit on different lines to go to from one part of the city to another part of the city. So these networks had different ways, different routes to go from one point to the other. And there are central hubs. There are hubs that connect many lines, different lines, these connection stations, like for example, Valderas that connect two lines. But also there are central hubs like Pantitlan, that it is a hub that connects many, many different lines. And also many of them arrive to it because it can go to different places. These systems of networks has been applied to genetic networks to understand how the genetics produce respiration, produce mitosis, processing of RNA, vesicle traffic, etc., etc. Or they can make networks that go from genetic interactions of DNA co-expression networks of RNA, protein interaction networks between all the proteins of the organism, or functional association networks. Moreover, these cellular and subcellular models have, can also be part of a subsystem and modulus level or an integrated organ system level, or more precisely to organism level. And what we consider is that health is exactly functional in this balance between a weed underexpressed network that it would be characteristic of a system that is very random or a very overexpressive network that is characteristic of a very robust system, a very connected system, a system that has low possibility to changes in contrast with a system that has a lot of randomness, but it is low capability to have fixed values. So functionality lies between these two complexity diversity. And this is the one network that will characterize health. These ideas come first from uh, Plamen Ivanov from his first words on, 12th, uh, on the beginning of this century that construct this new area of network physiology, considering all the subsystems that integrate the network. For example, when you are sleeping and these uh, transitions uh, on the network, on all the nodes that construct the system, how this change when you are in deep sleep to lie asleep and you can determine this connectivity of the network and for this connectivity of the network establish the health of the subject. With this on mind, we construct physiological networks that are taken not from the time series analysis as, as Plavin Ivanov and his group made, but from the data that is collected from blood uh, signal analysis, from anthropometric measurements, etc. So we have a database that is puntual, that is a raw values of data. And these values, or values uh, that has different units that have corresponds to different systems, are as normalized, considering health we take the values, for example, of uh, body mass index that has to be between 18 and 25. If you are outside this range, you are outside health. So we consider zero as the 18 value of DNA and 25 as the one value, and we normalize with these esteem values. For each of the parameters that we are considering on the system, 
we can establish this normalized database. If we are normalized in the sense that health is between zero and one, but of course we can have values outside the range that are characteristic of some diseases, of some perturbances of the system. With this normalized database, we made the Spearman correlations between all the variables in the system. And with these correlations, we construct the correlation matrix. This correlation matrix is based on the Spearman correlations. We made a p-value threshold selection. We say that this, the system has correlations lower, statistical correlations lower than 0 0.05, for example. Then we, we don't have correlation and we put it as zero. In the other cases, we, we kept the value of the correlation and we construct this matrix. Each point of this matrix corresponds to a node, which is a, a physiological variable, and the interactions with the network are precisely these values of the Spearman correlation. So we can construct a physiological network. This physiological network is very interesting because we don't know, need only to make a separation between the groups, and these groups are physiological functional groups. The body size and size biomarker are, for example, in this unit. A deposit is in this, lipids are in this region. Immunity responses in, this, in these variables. So you can understand all the systems that integrate the human body constructing this physiological network. It is important that this physiological network will depend on age, sex, and health. So we can construct the system and compare with healthy, and we can determine biomarkers that are outside the parameters of health. Here I will show you some of the results of our public, more recent publications that have to be with these physiological networks, first going from healthy soldiers to all soldiers and then to three different diseases that we are going to treat. Let's start with the physiological network of healthy soldiers. We mean with health that follow all the variables inside the established thresholds for health. I mean that they, when we normalize it, the values are between zero and one always. We have here data from students of Faculty of Medicine, young people around 21 years old that are healthy. We had 80 women and 60 men in these plots. And here what you see is that the correlations between physiological parameters are different on young men and women, not only in the hormonal characteristics, but in many other variables. For example, on variables that has to be with the config body configuration, obvious, but also in variables that have to do with the immune response of the system of the systolic blood pressure. As you see in this matrix, women are more stronger correlations, had higher values, there is more red the, the matrix in, than men of the same age. We had a more robust configuration in women than in men, as we have seen in the time series analysis of her variability. But here we are seeing from all the physiological variables and the correlation between them. Now, if we plot the physiological network from this data, what we see is that men has lower correlations, has lower links between different variables. The bridges that connect one system to the other also are few in comparison with women. Women have more rigid systems. All the systems are interconnected. There is connections everywhere. There are many ways to go from one variable to another variable. So the control is more robust, is more resilient the system. 
in comparison with young men. These topological differences are clearly seen, again, yellow corresponds to men, green to women, as you measure different variables of this topological network. Connectness, I mean how many connections have the system, is stronger in women than in men. The density is stronger on the network of men of women compared with men. The cluster is, is stronger, but there are more modulos. There are more systems apart. There are more groups. Than, there are clusters that are separated one from the other for men than compared with women. And if we consider how close is this network to the small world network that is typical of a system and balance between robustness and adaptability, I mean, a small world will be the typical example of a scaling variance in a system. We see that the network of men is more a small world than the one of women. Nevertheless, there are no statistical differences in other, way, in other measures. The efficiencies, both networks are equally efficient. The characteristic path length, I mean how to go from one variable to another, that trajectory that we follow to connect two nodes on the network is exactly similar. The diameter, the size of the network is the same. And uh, between us, uh, this, uh, how many neighbors you had in that in network are also similar. We can see better the difference on importance on considering the hierarchical difference of the physiological network. Plotting by hierarchy, I mean, which are the nodes that are more important and more relevant to the system. If we consider young, healthy people, for men, body fat is the most important, but for women, it's body mass index. And also, as you see in this hierarchy, there are more nodes in each of the levels for women compared to men. And most important, there are much more connections between all the levels and between all the nodes in the same level in the case of women than in the case of men. This made a different response to disease. If we consider a systemic disease like COVID-19 that destroys connections, that destroys the ways to go from one system to the other, because men have less connection than women, if we destroy no, uh, lines here, there is no way to go from one system to the other. So we segregate the system that men will perform worse to COVID-19 than the women. Because women had more ways to go from one node to the other, more ways to connect one system to the other, so it will respond better to, uh, to social disease. But vice versa, if we had a localized disease like achalasia, that is a gastric system problem, what we had is that the problem will dissipate, will propagate in all the network, through all the systems, because there are many connections, there are many ways to connect this node to all the systems. And in the case of men, the disease will remain in the system that it starts, because there are few ways to connect, there are few ways to propagate. Also, men will respond better to treatment, because they are designed to adaptation. They adapt to the changes of the environment. Women are more resilient. So for women, the response to treatment will be slower than the ones of men. For example, if we consider removal of nodes, what we have is that if we are removing nodes in the network of men, it will lose connectivity before women lose connectivity. We need to remove more, more nodes in the case of women. We need to destroy more connections in the case of women to have a worse performance on their disease than the, in the case of men. 
So, for example, in the case of COVID-19, we will expect that men will perform worse to the disease than women. Now, let us consider how, what happens when we are becoming old in this physiological network. Here, it is shown a network of me metabolic variables of people that are young, middle aged, and old. As you see, as we become old, what happens is that the connections become stronger, the network is more robust, is losing capability to adapt to changes on the environment. We are in a transit from a, a small world in the network to something that is more robust, more rigid, more resilient. And we also have a we start problems as we become older. The standard values of the population now are not in health conditions, but it starts to be with high blood pressure, with hypertrichidemia, with hyperlipidemia, with insulin resistance, higher values than the healthy soldiers. So we had a, when we become old, not only the parameters that characterize health out of the range of health, but also we start to have more connections and the systems lose capability to adapt to the changes. This can be seen in these topological transitions due to age that are plotted here. Here we consider the weighted transitivity on different ages, and as you see, from health to disease, we had a transition region that is between 20 and 50 years old. The community structure is also changed in a physiological network of healthy soldiers and of soldiers that had pathological conditions. In this uh, particular world, we were considered soldiers that had metabolic disturbance. And also, as you see, the transitions or the frequency of transitions that we have are, are also becoming less in the as we are becoming older. We are changing from a more adaptative uh, network to a network that is more robust, that is more, more resilient, and also that it has more pathological conditions than the one of healthy soldiers. Now let us consider some diseases. We will start with metabolic disorders. To illustrate the use of networks, let us consider only a triad case with three different metabolic variables, ABI1C, insulin resistance, and hyperglycemia. And see what happens also with glucose in the case of young, adult, and very old people. If you see, there is a change on the way that we connect the network. The strain of the network, it is lost when we are becoming old, but also the system is disrupted as we become old. So, there are metabolic changes that can be understood not only because the values of the glucose or the values of the insulin are different from healthy, young, unhealthy, old people, but also there is a strong difference on the connections and on the ways that you go from one system to the other. You connect glucose through insulin and HbA1c, in the case of young people, in the case of others, there is a way to do it, but it's not direct one. There is a triangle that connects the three. But in the case of old people, glucose is connected directly with HbA1c, and insulin resistance has nothing to do with the system. It is isolated variable. It's, it's, it loses the connection to the system. There is no way to go from one variable to the other. There is no direct connection between them. 
this is all see if we consider now the complete network here we put only variables that had to be with triglycerides glucose uric acid weight uh, measurements of waste, weight insulin height creatinine urea diastolic and systolic group pressure as you see there is a strong change between the system of the physiological network of people that is all and of the people that has a pathological problem that you had um, as you as progress in the pathology that uh, there are more nodes connected there are the system becomes more rigid and with less capacity to adapt to changes of the environment uh, especially to adapt to the changes that are when you eat when you may exercise you had less prob less adaptational capabilities as you become more sick now let us consider covid as you as i told you there is a strong difference between two types of disease the systemic ones that de destroys all the systems that that destroy the connection between all the physiological network and a disease as the one that we will see that is a calasia that is a localized one if we consider covid-19 here we are taking data from instituto nacional de ciencias médicas y nutrición salvador subirán of patients that were hospitalized on december 2021 and as you see we made a normalization of all the variables that we measured of the system these are all the variables that we had between 0 and 1 where 0 is the lowest uh, variable uh, limit and 1 is the highest limit is that defines health on the parameters in accordance to um, la, the le medical literature this green session is the values that are in health we consider five different groups female young people that were recovered male young people that were recovered male young people that unfortunately deceased male men old people that recovered and male men old people that deceased what we do is many different ways to see the physiological changes through the physiological network we construct the matrix of correlations experimental correlations and we made a principal component analysis of that matrix as you see there are a separation of the most important variables relevant to the disease that we are seeing and the most important variables had to do with uh, clinical parameters of inflammation but also with the age with the physical uh, the body mass index with the body fat so we can establish parameters biomarkers that are characteristics of the disease there is also uh, that a strong difference on the network as you see this is the physiological correlation matrix of men control of young men that that has no any disease and as you see as as you remember there are connections in all the system and these connections are broken on covid what covid makes is to destroy that connections between different systems between different variables there is no way to go from one variable to the other so you lose homeostasis because you lose the way to con to correlate that system to control one system through other variables this loss of, of homeostasis is a stronger in the, and the difference are clearly seen in many variables in, in most of the variables of the system but more precisely on these two squares that has to do with aspartame amino acids and uh, respiratory rate pulmonary involvement etc so these will be the ones that are in the 
pink square or the ones that are on the green squares will be the variables that will be successful as biomarkers of the disease that made a strong difference between man that recovered than man that unfortunately dead. So these variables will be the ones that you have to look if you want to understand how possible, how difficult is the disease and how much you need to treat. Here you see the difference between the network, physiological network of men, young people, healthy, the young men that recover and the young men that disease. As you see, there is a lot of fragmentation of the system. There is a lot of loss of connectivity between the system and also between the variables. It's the most important feature of this disease. But if you consider not only man, as you know, to make worse, uh, to have a worse results in women, you have to be stronger the, the structure. So more fragmentation will be seen in that network of women. Here you have the simplified network, only to see the, how the connections between groups are destroyed, of people where, uh, where is men don't recover, women that will recover it. As you see, there is a connection that is, are not lost. But when you consider the ones that, that unfortunately dead, there is a, a stronger separation in groups. There is a, this loss of connectivity due to this to the disease. The topology of the physiological network is also very different. Here you have in green the one of woman that is healthy, the control. Yellow is the data from men that were healthy for our control. And here you compare different parameters, the topological efficiency, network density. As you see, all these have a strongly difference. There is a statistical significant difference between all of them. The average path length is also changed strongly. The modularity is change, the transitivity is completely lost in the case of COVID patients, clustering coefficients are also changing, the entropy of channel is strongly less for the people who is with the disease than from healthy people. This is uh, expected. If you had a uh, less probability to less complexity of your system if you had less probability to transmit the information to process information then you are in a, a strong disease and this is the small world index that is also changed in these patients what we also want to see is that there is not only a difference on the people that has the covid but also the people who recover but have uh, long COVID and are under treatment, this is also data from Instituto Nacional de Ciencias Médicas y Nutrición, what we see is that if we consider, as usually, all the patients, all the subjects, and all the variables are measured, as you see where, uh, the changes uh, of the, the disease uh, slowly transits to health, but if you consider men and women, the response is different. Men respond faster than women. So the treatment of COVID needs to take in account also the sex of the patients. This is uh, the case if we consider all the subjects, if we not, make no difference between them. We, if you do that, you will say that after 15 days of treatment, all the patients recover after 90 days are in the same state as before. But if you made a difference between men, blue, and women, pink, you see that men recover faster than women. Women still are not recovered after 90 days. They need a strong, longer treatment than men. Let us finish.
finish our discussion with acalasia. In acalasia, there is an inability of the lower sphincter to relax and open to let food pass into the stomach. In at least half of the patients, the lower sphincter resting pressure is also anormally high. So it is a very bad disease. In few patients, it, it is present. It is not very common disease, but it's very localized disease. As we expected, it would be a strong difference of the disease in the behavior of women and men. And also, it would be differences that would be notable in the how it performs, the, how it evolves the, the disease in men compared with women. As you see in men, there is a, a, a localized disease that has damage on few nodes, nodes that have to, be, to deal with the gastrointestinal system. While in the case of women, the disease is spread in all the systems, in all the different parts that compose the human body of the woman. If we may hear the difference between the networks of men, women, and the, that compare both nodes, you see that there is a lot of connections that are present in men but are loosened in women. And there is also a strong difference between the two systems. Women will be perform worse for, in a calasia than men do. For conclusion, let us consider that this loss of homeostatic control or a damage on a physiological network can be measured by physiological puntual parameters. Its interactions or by physiological time series and its correlations leading to biomarkers that depend on cells and age, which can help on the diagnosis of physiological health or a treatment evaluation. Our goal is in the future to go to a personalized medicine that you can have a smartwatch, for example, with measures many different physiological signals from your head, from your vascular, from your lungs, from your muscles, from your oximetry, etc., to allow you to construct the physiological network of each subject and to find biomarkers of the health of these subjects. And when you go out of these biomarkers, then there is an alert that tells you, go to the doctor to check your state of health and maybe you had a disease. So our work was to make a personalized medicine for each subject. Before ending, let me tell you that this work was done in partial financial support from the GAPA UNAN and CONACYT, and it would be not possible without the help of my friends, Juan Claudio Toledo Roy, Ruben Fosio, and Alejandro Fan, my professors, that unfortunately some of them are dead, like Bernardo Golf and Carlos Alcácer Corán, and of course of the Bruno Estañol, my postdoctoral researchers, Wadi Alexander Rios Herrera, Elizabeth Ibarra Coronado, Paula Olguín, Antonio Barajas Martínez, my students, Vania Martínez Garcés, Montserrat Ramírez, Pablo Berumen, Geraldine Tello, Juan Antonio López Rivera, Leonardo Hernández Cano, Clementina Castañares Garcido, José Luis Gómez, and my collaborations uh, come from, not only from UNAM, but also from Instituto Nacional de Ciencias Médicas y Nutrición. Thank you for your attention, and I'm here for your questions.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. Now it's time for our next speaker of this morning. This conference is the chart of Dr. Mariana Gomez Chabón. Dr. Mariana Gomez Chabón is a junior faculty member of the League in Mexico and an adjunct research at IBO in Chile. She received her PhD degree in computational biology and bioinformatics from Duke University. Here, research has been focused on epigenetic and stochastic gene expression, focusing on the proprietors and evolutionary emerge of the established suited principles and limitation of cellular feedback control. At least she aims to understand how the dynamic properties of gene regulatory circuit emergence, proliferation and persist through natural selection. Her work combines evolutionary theory, population genetics, and biophysical model of gene regulatory circuits. Today, we are here to listen to her talk on origin and evolution of dynamic properties of gene regulatory circuits and fluctuation environment. Time, Mariana gomez Chablan. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers for this opportunity and you all for being here. In these few minutes, I will tell you a little bit about the vision of my lab, where we are studying the origin and evolution of the dynamic properties of gene regulatory circuits, focusing on the context of fluctuating environments. So uh, this vision lies within the field of evolutionary systems biology that as its name suggests, aims to approach the systems biology general questions with an evolutionary perspective. Of course, this is too big and just a systems biology for the last 20, 25 years can mean very different things to each of us. So to better explain to you what we understand for evolutionary systems biology, I will start by explaining why we want to take this approach in the first place. Hopefully, we all agree here uh, that to be able to comprehend the astounding complexity of life, we must understand the wide variety of dynamical emerging properties which arise from gene regulatory circuits. The thing is that historically, particularly in the field of systems biology, this approach has been um, this problem has been approached by deeming the cell as a machine. This is a modular, functionally designed machine. Nevertheless, the phenomena that we aim to understand are the product of evolutionary processes. And the solutions found by evolution might not agree with the strategies conceived for actual engineering machines. We believe that understanding how evolutionary processes give shape to gene regulatory circuits will allow us to determine both the how and why of a particular system. Now, by understanding how evolutionary processes shape the emerging properties of gene regulatory circuits, we are as well shedding light into the fundamental trade-offs driving the evolutionary dynamics. This is because natural selection at the end acts over phenotypes, which are precisely these emerging properties. But their structural principles and performance limitations are pretty much still unknown. Particularly, and this takes me to the third point I want to highlight here, um, is considering the omnipresent biochemical noise. Understanding how the presence of noise affects the design principles of the gene regulatory circuits and the resulting evolutionary trade-offs, as well as the, uh, the role of the noise per se. And we believe that taking in account these three components together, with this evolutionary systems biology perspective, we can deduce the structural principles of gene regulatory circuits and contribute with a mechanistic understanding of the evolutionary processes. Now, how? Well, um, this is actually not a trivial task. We need to consider a wide range of temporal scales from minutes to a few generations to environmental cycles and a wide range of structural scales as well. Um, that go from what is happening at the molecular level, at the network level, and finally, at the population level. And 
So for, to do this, we need to develop a theoretical framework, a new theoretical framework that allow us to link the molecular dynamics and the evolutionary dynamics. And as I believe, maybe erroneously, that one doesn't just see it and envision a new whole new framework, uh, we propose to start by exploring these questions of the origin and evolution of the dynamic properties of gene regulatory circuits and build this needed framework from there. And actually, an ideal niche to study the overlap between molecular and evolutionary dynamics is to study the strategies implemented by organisms to deal with a fluctuating environment. So organisms live in a constant fluctuating environment with different levels of uncertainty, different frequencies and types of changes, etc. But at the end, an unavoidable fluctuating environment. So it is not surprising that organisms have developed a wide variety of mechanisms to deal with this. But in very general terms, the organism has basically two options. It either changes as the environment changes to keep up with the demands, or it actively suppresses or compensates the effects of these changes. In this latter case, the phenomena are better known as homeostasis or biochemical adaptation. And there are multiple examples in biological systems ranging from cells to ecosystems. Given that limited time here, I won't get into this at all uh, in the rest of the talk, but it is, it is an important branch of research in our lab. And please approach me later if you want to know more about it. On the other hand, when the organism decides to vary as the environment changes, there is as well a wide range of diverse strategies. But just to mention the, the most obvious ones, highlighting that these are not mutually exclusive, the organism can adapt genetically through mutation and natural selection. It can have a machinery in place to sense and respond to specific environmental cues, and it can as well try to anticipate these changes, either stochastically, a phenomenon known as dead hedging, or through encoded rhythms or clocks. And uh, the cool thing here, uh, particularly for us and our interest, is that all these are actually the result of dynamic properties of gene regulatory circuits. And these are the emerging properties we focus in the lab, from uh, feedback control to plasticity, oscillations, and peer stability. And for the rest of my talk, I will uh, tell you the story. Um, it's not changing, sorry. I will tell you the story of how by stable molecular system, which in this context we call epignetic switches, can be selected as a mechanism of pet hedging, allowing a population to anticipate and survive fast fluctuating environments. So first, what are these epigenetic switches? They are by stable molecular systems, which means basically that for one genotype, the system can display two distinct phenotypes. And in the biological context, these biostable systems have two properties that are particularly relevant. Memory, which refers to epigenetic inheritance when it can be transmitted through generations, and stochastic transitions that allows populations um, to do this pet hedging strategy, in other words, diversifying an isogenic population. To study these epigenetic switches, we develop a model of the simplest gene regulatory circuit capable of displaying the stability. This is a self-induced gene, and we consider, again, for simplicity, only two biochemical reactions, the protein synthesis event, and uh, where the function, the, the rate uh, of this event occurring depends positively and non-linearly of the concentration of the same protein. By the way, these are requirements to display the stability. And we have the, also the protein degradation event, depending on um, where each molecule simply decays with a constant rate. Now, this simple system, depending on the biochemical parameter values, can display three relevant qualitative behaviors. We can have a monostable, low expression level, we can have a monostable high expression level, or we can have a um, biostable switch between these low and high expression levels. Because we take into account the presence of biochemical noise, then the two monostable cases here are represented by a unimodal distribution of protein numbers, always around the 
predicted state state value, while the bias table switch has these stochastic transitions between the two expression levels and results in a bimodal distribution. Now, in the evolutionary context, the biochemical parameters represent our genotype. And the number of protein, of, of our protein of interest, represent the phenotype of interest. Now, I just wanted to uh, highlight here that this is not a stretch, like defining the biochemical parameters as the genotype makes sense because they are, they are effectively shaped by the genetic background and mutations in the genetic background will move around or tune these uh, parameter values. Now, we can find in the biochemical parameter space genotypes that display the phenotype that is being selected in the environment, right? Like we can pinpoint in this space. Now, going back to a fluctuating environment, then the population can adapt to these changes, to the, the, the changes in the environment through genetic adaptation, for example. In this case, it will be moving through the biochemical parameter space, through the genotypic space, uh, from maybe a genotype that has um, it is the it has the optimal expression level in the high environment to a genotype that has the optimal expression level in the low environment. These true mutations and natural selection. If you are looking at what happens in the population uh, for this system, every generation we will have the uh, distribution of phenotypes in the population get getting wider, both because we have biochemical noise. Uh, in the system and also because of new mutations arising, but natural selection keeps it centered around the optimal fitness. It will choose the individuals that have the, the best uh, possible fitness and keeping it there. Once the environment changes and now you are selecting for a different phenotype, then the population will gradually shift toward this new optimal value, always selecting the individuals that does it better until you once again have your population centered around this fitness. And again, every generation you will have some uh, individuals that get out of the ideal optimal, but natural selection keep it in place, right? This is very much how we will think about genetic adaptation in general. On the other hand, the population can also adapt to these uh, environmental changes through epigenetic switching. In this case, keeping it tied in a specific uh, genotype that we are going to call the bias stable genotype that actually has the two phenotypes associated to it are optimal in each of the environments, and we have stochastic transitions between them. So just as before, when the population is adapted to the current environment, you will have it centered around the optimal fitness. Every generation, it will get wider because of new mutations and noise. But now we have, in addition, these stochastic transitions are going to the alternative phenotype available in this bi-stable switch. But it's precisely when the environment changes that these uh, few individuals that have made the stochastic transition are ready to take over the population, potentially adapting much faster until, once again, the population is centered uh, around the ideal, um, the optimal phenotype. And again, every single transition, you will get this widening on the distribution as well as the stochastic transition. But um, so these have different properties, potentially different adaptation times and all these things, but we don't fully or we didn't fully understand how the different evolutionary conditions will favor each of these strategies. And that is exactly what we wanted to uh, address in this project. So in order to explore it, what are the evolutionary conditions that favor the selection of epigenetic switching over genetic adaptation, we implemented the following evolutionary model. We consider that the environment fluctuates between two states that favor either low or high expression of the protein of interest that we call A. Uh, each of these environment is described by two different fitness functions. And then for each generation, we consider a population with N individuals, each of them with a copy of the gene circuit of interest and importantly, its own genotype, its own values for the kinetic, for the biochemical parameters. Given those biochemical parameters, we simulate the expression of the gene dynamics of this gene circuit, uh, considering the biochemical noise in the system, and assign a fitness value to each cell given the observed expression 
or the obtained expression value. We then, like once we have our population with each individual uh, with its fitness value, we then select the individuals to be cloned in the next generation, this according to the fitness uh, distribution in the population, but also to a parameter of selection pressure that we can uh, play with and see uh, the, the different effects in the system. And every time we clone an individual, to, to, to the new generations, we allow with certain probability to new mutations to arise. And in addition of the probability of having a mutation, we also have an important parameter here, that is the step size, how different can be the mutants from the original parent. And we play with all these parameters to systematically explore the evolutionary conditions and, and try to make sense and learn something about the um, evolutionary uh, selection of this epigenetic switch. So we repeat this for every generation. This is a generation cycle, and we do it for multiple generations bearing our environment. Now, importantly, in parallel with these simulations, we are also running what we call control simulations, where everything is kept the same, except that the gene dynamics are simulated deterministically. In other words, we remove the biochemical noise, Epigenetic switching can only occur uh, with the stochastic transitions, which are effectively driven by this noise. Then this control experiments allows us to evaluate if anything that is observed, particularly the presence of biostable systems, are truly being selected for their epigenetic switching adaptation strategy potential. Right, And uh, this is going to be uh, hopefully clearer as I show you some of the results. OK. So the first thing we observed is that the population adapted to the fluctuating environment per se, starting from an arbitrary genotype that is optimal in one of the environments, but not in the other. The population migra migrates through the genotypic space, gradually increasing its fitness, considering the whole environmental cycle, one epoch in the low environment, one epoch in the high environment. In this close up, we can see that being adapted to just one environment as we started is uh, simply not sustainable. Uh, every time you are in the other environment, the population will try to adapt to that environment and getting farther away from the solution. And eventually you just have bad fitness in both environments. But as the population migrates, you get to a, a different region of the parameter space where the population is capable to adapt every time the environment changes in just a, a, few, a few generations effect efficiently adapt. Now, um, for this case, the results not the, the, uh, the population doesn't only migrate to a region where it's actually selecting for a high nonlinearity in the in this parameter, in the in the regulation in the self regulation, but also a high frequency of bistable individuals in the population. We then compare the simulations to our control simulations without biochemical noise, and we observe that just as before, the population migrates through the genotypic space to a region with high linearity, but it just stays right in the corner before getting into the biostable region with very low frequency of biostable individuals. So this without biochemical noise, high nonlinearity selected, but not the stability. So to try to make sense of this, like the, the idea that uh, the even if the stability is only useful in the presence of noise, the nonlinearity is being selected regardless, we took advantage that uh, of having a well-defined model where we can define the range of solution phenotypes for each environment and then calculate the distance between these solutions in the genotypic space. When less mutations are needed to obtain the desired change in the phenotype, we say that we have a higher uh, genetic potential. This is how we calculate it. But again, for time, I'm not getting into details. This map here shows the genetic potential, and it shows how it increases as you approach uh, the bistable region, um, particularly having the highest potential uh, genetic potential in the biostable region where the distance is effectively zero because without any mutation, you can have both phenotypes. And uh, you can see uh, here that the trajectories of the simulations that we try very, very clearly move through the genetic potential gradient with or without noise in the simulations, selecting for high nonlinearity as the genetic potential increases. So this basically is um, 
telling us what is happening in the first selection process. But that is not the whole story here. When we repeat these simulations for different frequencies of the environmental changes, we observe that as the environment becomes slower, the epochs become larger, then uh, the selected nonlinearity also becomes larger. Even if the population is already in this region where the genetic potential is optimal, more importantly, this is not uh, observed in the control simulations. We don't have the same pattern in the control simulations. It's only in the presence of noise. So uh, we look a little closer to the adaptation dynamics for successful populations, populations that are already adapted to the fluctuating environment per se. More specifically, we look at how the fitness of exactly one generation after each environmental transition and exactly nine generations after each environmental transition varies as the evolutionary parameters uh, becoming the most important one, and that's the one I show here, particularly the environmental uh, fluctuation frequency that we call NU changes, right? This is what these plots are showing to you. Now, we choose the, the first generation because it is effectively telling us something about the adaptation time in the population, while the, looking at nine generations after the transition is telling us something about the uh, phenotypic robustness in the population once it has adapted to the new environment. Now, as you can see in this plot, uh, this revealed a trade-off between these two properties. And this trade-off is actually modulated by nonlinearity in the regulatory functions. As the environment becomes slower, that is getting like darker in this plot, you can see that you don't only select for higher uh, heal coefficient values as we observed in the previous plot, but also that this results in a decrement on the adaptation time, like it becomes the, the fitness that you have just one generation after transition is lower, but at the same time, the fitness that you have after nine generations becomes higher. So exactly the, the different, uh, it's pulling you in, in the opposite uh, directions. And I don't have time uh, to get into the details right now, but we have shown that this is a causal relationship and the relationship with the environmental frequency actually makes sense as conditions with longer epochs will spend more time, relatively speaking, adapted in uh, the uh, uh, new environment compared to the transition period. So it makes sense that the system is prioritizing the phenotypic robustness here. Now, linking these mechanistic observations to the use strategy to adapt to the fluctuating environments was not trivial at all. It wasn't until we looked directly at the surviving lineages on the population that we could effectively assign the use strategy to each of our like populations in the in the evolutionary simulations. But once we ha we have the surviving lineages, we are looking at it uh, that we can without problems extract from evolution our evolutionary simulations. It is actually very easy to differentiate between the diver diverse strategies. If the parental lineages survive um, a full environmental cycle with a biostable genotype and no mutations whatsoever, we say that these populations or these uh, lineages are using epigenetic switching. On the other extreme, if the parental lineages survive a full environmental cycle with at least one monostable genotype, oops, sorry, and at least two mutations, we call this genetic adaptation. And we actually observe a hybrid strategy where parental lineages survive a full environmental cycle with only biostable genotypes, but at least two mutations. And we call this biostable adaptation. We can quantify the, the occurrence of these different strategies along multiple evolutionary conditions, 10 replicas each for at least 100 cycles, et cetera, et cetera. And we get this heat map that you can see here clearly noting that each adaptation strategy are favored in uh, different, under different evolutionary conditions. More specifically, epigenetic switches are favored in fast fluctuating environment. This regardless of the other evolutionary parameters that we were looking at, particularly regardless of the mutation step size. 
On the other hand, for a slow fluctuating environments, we can see that a genetic adaptation is favored only if the uh, mutation steps can be big enough, so it allows you to, to adapt fast enough. Otherwise, uh, the system prefers to implement this bi-stable adaptation. Noteworthy, we corroborated uh, with our control simulations that in this case where you don't have noise and then epigenetic switching and bi-stable adaptation cannot be functional without this biochemical noise. In this, cases, uh, in this case, we observe that all the strategies were always genetic adaptation. So this is validating our method and also the um, interpretation of these results. Just to close the knot here that puts all these things part together, uh, is actually the role of the biochemical noise. When we look at the map of the load of the biochemical noise related to the genotype, we can see that the regions where the genetic potential was higher also have a, large, a larger uh, noise load, except in the biostable region. So epigenetic switches allow for fast adaptation without imposing such a large noise load on the phenotype. And of course, noise is also the driver of, for the uh, epigenetic transitions, so this basically explains the trade-off between the adaptation time and phenotypic robustness, as well as how the non-linearity level regulates it. So in conclusion here, uh, we can see that uh, selecting for higher genetic potential allows for the emergence of epigenetic switching because it drives the population around the region where the stability is available. The non-linearity is fundamental to modulate the trade-off between uh, adaptation potential or adaptation time and the phenotypic robustness. And epigenetic switches are actually superior in fast fluctuating environments because it allows you to have this fast adaptation without compromising too much the, uh, the, the noise load. And I didn't show you this, but we actually tested very different alternative assumptions, conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And the qualitative observations here are robust to that. In terms of general insights, we observed that lineages uh, reveal are important to reveal these hidden forces. We couldn't get this without observing the parental lineages. We are also showing how selection, natural selection can act over uh, emerging properties. And this is important to understand appearance and maintenance of complexity. And as future work, we are looking at what happens when you add the potential for sensing the environment. This is plasticity and other anticipation strategies as oscillations. All this is published and available in this paper here. Now, um, I think I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to mention we are working on this. We're expanding this in the lab. We have the work uh, by Cristina Sotomayor, an undergrad in my lab, which is exploring how plasticity can be added uh, to the system and trying to understand when plasticity will be favored in this fluid environment. This is the model she's suggesting. We are observing a really cool emerging property uh, in the presence of noise that sadly I don't have time to go into details. Uh, on the other hand, Sofia Orozco, also an undergrad in my lab, is working on considering, in addition of this epigenetic switching and genetic adaptation, also oscillations and the competition between a lot of them. So she proposed this model that can actually have all the behaviors. It has more stability, it has this stability, and importantly, oscillations. And just as well, in the presence of noise, we are observing actually really cool emerging properties that we are also very excited to, uh, to understand when these are a favorite in the evolutionary context. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions. Just a really quick announcement here. We are looking for graduate students to join the lab. So if you're interested, please contact me. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vamesh Shabon, for the very interesting talk. And now we have some time for questions. <laughs> 